You know, my life vision statement that I believe God has called me to is to make a difference, to make an impact in the lives of people. That's it. And that's not something that you ever fully attain. It's always out there. And somebody says, well, how do you do that on a daily basis? I said, I don't know. It just depends on whoever I encounter. And if I have that in mind, how can I serve you? Then I am aware and attentive to possibilities. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast of Audacious Faith. And I have a special guest with me today. I'm very excited about having him. I've been wanting to have him as a guest for a little while, and he has graciously agreed uh, to join us today. He has actually been a pastor for many years. He now considers himself a retired pastor, although I don't know that you ever really retire. (laughs) And uh, he's got a lot of other accreditations to him. Um, this is Dr. William Beachy, PhD, and he's got a bunch of other letters as well uh, that he can go into if he likes to. And do uh, you want me to go by William or we'll go by Bill today? Uh, yeah, I'm Bill. You just can't call me Dr. Cuddles. That's that's reserved for my wife. You know, as tempting I as it is, I'm going to let know. her have it. I'm going <laughs> to let her have it. So, Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm really looking forward to having you share with, with our audience today. Uh, why don't we just start off right right from the start, kind of tell us a little bit about you, your background, okay. and especially important, how it is that you came to faith. Yeah, yeah. well, you, you, you mentioned at the outset, you know, I got a lot of letters behind my name, and you know what? All those letters really don't mean anything unless you care for people. They don't care how much you know if they if they don't uh, believe that you care for them, and so it's very important to me to care for people. But backing up a little bit, you know, I'm going to try to give you the Cliff Notes version of uh, about 50 or 60 years, and I hope that doesn't turn everybody off when they think, oh boy, here we go. Uh, but uh, just very uh, quickly, raised on a farm in Ohio, went to church every Sunday. On Sunday mornings, my dad would turn on the record player, for those of you who are old enough to remember those old style uh, record players, and turn on Tennessee Ernie Ford uh, album. And uh, every Sunday morning, he, I would wake up to that. Uh, participated in church a lot, VBS, youth group, etc. I believe I accepted Christ and was baptized at age 12. And I felt at that time that God wanted me to, quote, become a preacher. And that was the last thing in the world that I wanted to do. And I did everything that I could to avoid it. Hmm. So after high school, I graduated high school a year early, uh, 17. I went to Ohio University for for two years and was not very successful. In the end, the academic dean invited me or told me to leave. Uh, I worked for a while, and then I ended up in Abilene, Texas, and I met some folks down there, and they invited me to a church service, and it was there at age 19 that um, I rededicated my life to Christ. Uh, soon after that, I moved back to Ohio, uh, began to participate in that little country church where I was raised and helped facilitate a youth movement in our church where 50, 60 young people would gather in that little white country church that averaged 50 people on Sunday morning. And we'd have Bible studies and worship and camp fires and sing kumbaya on you know this was back uh, at the beginning of looking at church and relationship with god in a very very different way with contemporary music and guitars this was in um, 1971 i ended up um, about a year later marrying a girl from texas and i moved back to texas we went to mcmurray college in abilene and i was about a year from graduation with a business and finance degree my wife happened to be a musician, a very fine musician, and I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And so um, I went in to talk to the head of the music department and said, I'd like to get a music degree. And he said, oh, OK, good. Well, uh, can you sing something for us? And I said, well, I don't sing. And he said, well, can okay. you play, some, play something for us? And I said, I don't play anything. And he said, well, didn't you play in the high school band? And I said, no. The only thing I remember is flutophone in the third grade. And he said, you don't understand. People that come and do a music degree have a lot of background. So you can't just dive into a music program in college without any background. But I persuaded him to let me try. And at um, 
21 years old, 22 years old, I became a music major. It took me an extra three years, but I ended up graduating with a uh, degree in vocal performance and uh, conducting. Mm -hmm. I went on, decided to go on and do graduate work, had scholarships at Arizona State University and Peabody in Nashville in vocal performance. So I decided to go to Nashville and uh, in the middle of my first semester, I dropped out because it wasn't what I was supposed to do. I was going to be a church musician. Um, so I dropped out, uh, stayed in Nashville for another six or eight months. Later that spring, my wife and I uh, wrote, recorded, and produced an album of original mu music. Uh, we mo moved back to Texas and then took our music on the road and traveled around the country doing concerts and revivals. And it was during that first year of travel that I felt led to go to seminary. And I was not the least bit happy about that. I ended up going to seminary, kicking and screaming in the uh, fall of 1980 to Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. And during those three years, we traveled on the weekends doing concerts and revivals. I think we were in 22 states and, I don't know, 15 or 20 different denominations. We didn't have classes on Mondays, so that really helped for our weekend travel. So I finished uh, seminary in three years doing the evangelistic work as a way to make it through seminary. Graduated from there, went back to Texas. I became an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church denomination and then felt led to do graduate work so that I could work with pastors. So in the spring of 1986, I was looking around for a Ph.D. program and was accepted at one in uh, at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. So I told my church, I said, I'm, I'm going to do this in about three or four months. We're going to move to, to Pittsburgh and I resign from my, my position. Uh, but I'm going to wait until I hear from up there to see if there's a church, a small church that I can pastor to help me while I'm working on uh, school. Mm -hmm. One day I went to uh, the local bank. My, um, the chair of my finance team was a local bank president, and I went in to talk to him. And he was a cowboy. He had his, uh, his uh, boots up on his desk and had his cowboy hat on and smoking a cigar. And he said, well, have you heard anything from Pittsburgh? Have you got a place to go up there? I said, no, this is mid-May, you know, and I'm getting kind of anxious about it. I said, no, I haven't heard anything. And he, he said, and I'm using his language. He said, well, preacher, in his Texas draw, he said, well, preacher, if you're going to do this damn fool thing, don't you think there ought to be a little bit of faith involved? And I went, yep, yeah, you're right. I went home, called my supervisor in the Methodist Church, gave him my two weeks notice, uh, borrowed the church van uh, from the church where I was pastor, took a 15 passenger van, took all the seats out of it, borrowed a 17 and a half foot cattle trailer from one of the local ranchers, loaded up everything I had uh, with the exception of my wife and two kids um, and headed towards Pittsburgh. I looked like grapes of wrath in reverse. Didn't have a forwarding address, didn't know what I was going to do. I thought, I'd, well, I'll find a uh, storage bin somewhere and get everything up there, and then we'll work everything out later. On my way up there, uh, my wife got a hold of me and said that uh, there was a church that had called that wanted to talk to me. So I called them, and they said, can you come and visit with us tomorrow? And I said, yeah, I'm going to be in town. I said, now, I'm, you know, I'm traveling. I'm moving. The only thing I have that's decent to wear other than cutoffs and T-shirts is a, is a pair of coveralls. And they said, well, if they're clean, come on over. So I went over, visited with them. They asked me to be their pastor. I said, yes. Uh, the parsonage was open, and so I was able to offload uh, all of my belongings right into the parsonage and uh, then drove back home and three weeks later took my family up there. So I um, did a Ph.D. in spiritual formation at Duquesne University. Uh, they told me it would take five years of residency in writing, and I told them, well, I'm, I've only got three years. <laughs> you know, I don't have anybody supporting me with this. I'm doing this on my own. So they let me try, and I finished the coursework and all the um, uh, defending the 
the uh, proposal for the dissertation and the language requirements and all that in three years. And then I went back to Texas to a church to write my dissertation. And uh, that took a little while. I defended my 650 page dissertation two days before I turned 40. And uh, the next summer then, I went on the faculty at Asbury Seminary uh, leading the Beeson program. They had received a $40 million endowment uh, with the um, a direction to create a, um, a program, a doctor of ministry program for preachers uh, in residence called the Beeson, Pas- Beeson uh, Center for Preaching and Leadership. And so I led that for three and a half years, developed the, the program, got it off the ground. And in the middle of that, I lost a marriage and I was in a very, very dark place, you know, just shaking my fist at God, you know, for six months, wandering around Wilmore at four o'clock in the morning. And the only prayer that I had was, oh, God, God, I've been moving towards this all of my life. This is my life work. You know, I've been nominated for a couple of presidencies at, a, at some Christian universities, but I was eliminated from consideration because I was divorced. I remember one call uh, from a university. They were asking me if I'd consider becoming the dean of their school of theology. And I said, now you need to know that I'm divorced. And immediately, you know, it was just like they said, thanks, but no thanks. And so I went, okay, God, well, I don't know what you have in mind, uh, but continued to take the next step. And through it all, I found that my Redeemer was faithful and true. And a couple of years later, I married Barbara. Uh, Barbara's husband was deceased, and she had two girls who were ages 10 and 12. And uh, my sons were 10 and 12. And after the divorce, my sons were with me. And so we married and blended our family with uh, people called us the the Beachy Group, you know, <laughs> and, or the Beachy Gang. And uh, I went back in the local church as a pastor, was in the local church, in three different churches for 18 years. But all that time, I was wanting to get back in the classroom mm. because my 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 calling to do graduate work was 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 precipitated by a desire of a calling that I felt that God wanted me to work with pastors and was never able to do that. So I took early retirement from the local church uh, without, <laughs> without any prospects of a job or continued uh, income revenue, but felt that's what God was wanting me to do. And then I began to teach adjunct for Ashland Seminary. I lived in, I live in Lansing, Michigan, and they had an extension site in Detroit. And so I called the dean in Ashland, Ohio, and said, you know, I'm available to teach uh, in your, uh, your Detroit site. And they were looking for somebody to teach theology and church history and things like that. So I did that for a couple of years, and then they invited me to go full time. Uh, and uh, they had just received a million dollar grant from the Lilly Foundation, and they uh, hired me full time to develop a program. And I hear this for pastors. Uh, so it came full circle to that call yeah. to work with pastors that I had felt 30 years previously. And so yeah. I've done that for the past six years. I'm going to finish full time with the seminary at the end of August, but I will continue as an adjunct teaching in a graduate certificate program I developed called Faith-Based Entrepreneurship. So that's the drink of water from a fire hydrant uh, about how I came to Christ. And Well, I didn't tell you, but, you know, some of my leading up to what I'm doing today. Amen. Amazing. I love, here's what I love, and, and I've seen this in other episodes talking with other people as well, is that the combination and all the twists and turns that you went into, but how God takes everything and it's all a part of who you are now and yeah. full circle yeah. moments, you know, things that were way back. And then he brings it back decades later, mm-hmm. doesn't waste anything. I mean, the pastoral experience, you name it, just puts it all together. Um, and, and I know we're going to talk a little later about some of the other ways that he's, he's using that, Yeah, but yeah. Um, just, you you can definitely so I so I think it's fair to say as as you were uh kind of laying it all out there is even 
even in the darker moments still you, you you've got god just working everything and knitting it all together you can just see his handiwork as you look back mm. and even looking forward right yeah. yeah so pretty amazing pretty amazing so so let's jump to this then um you you, you spent time as a pastor um what what did you love about that and then also mm. what are some of the things that maybe were the challenging parts of it as sure, well what, sure. what kind of sticks out you know the things that i loved about being in the local church um and there were dozens hundreds of them were those tender moments of grace and mercy mm -hmm. you know helping guiding facilitating somebody anybody taking their next steps towards and with jesus i loved preaching i didn't love the um the preparation time um, but an opportunity to guide people and to share with them what i believe god had given to me those are really the highlights of course being a musician you know i love the music in the local church sometimes it's a curse and a blessing to be a pastor and a musician and so i play with the praise band and you know uh, once a month or so and but i just really had to hold that back because that had been such a strong thing in my life uh, previously so those are things that i loved i uh, really loved about the local church i would say to summarize what i didn't like about the local church is working with people who had hidden agendas um in working with teams or people that uh, demanded something. I remember one point um, uh, was up on the platform after a Sunday morning, the last church where I was, a lady came up and said, I need your cell phone number. And I said, okay, why is that? Because I wasn't giving my cell phone out to anybody except uh, people on the staff and other leaders, that sort of thing, because I came to believe that a pastor does not need to be omni-available 24-7. And a lot of pastors struggle with that, believing that that's part of ministry is to being available at any time, anywhere, for any reason. And so I told the woman, I said, no, I'm not going to give you my cell phone number. Uh, why do you need it? She said, well, I'm going on vacation. What if something happens and I need you? And I said, well, there are ways to get a hold of me. Uh, in the church, we had somebody could call the church landline and press a certain number as they went through the menu that could leave a message. And that message then would trigger a cell phone that was the church cell phone. We call it the bat phone because it was red. And we had four ordained ministers on staff and each one of us would be a minister on call one week a month. So each one of us would carry that cell phone. If that cell phone went off, we could pick up the message and then uh, attend to it. And so I told her, that's how you can get a hold of me. And she became so angry that I would not give her my cell phone number that she left the church. And so I don't know what the hidden agenda was, whether it was some sense of control. Uh, this is what you do. This is an expectation that I have. If you don't fulfill it, then I'm removing myself from this ministry. So, you know, I could give you dozens of examples and other pastors could as well. Those, those sorts of, those sorts of things uh, that, that happened. And so people with hidden agendas, you know, I just, I, I, I believe in appropriate transparency and vulnerability so that we can have reasonable conversations. If we don't agree, then let's seek how to navigate it and see what God wants for us and, and the next steps that we can take together. And we can take the next steps together, even if we don't agree. I remember one one guy on our in our band who was a bass player came to me one time. He said, Pastor, he says, I've moved in with my girlfriend. And I said, okay, well, um, I'm glad that things are going well for you, but um, you need to step back from, I'm not going to let you be on the platform. Mm -hmm. And his girlfriend came in and she was just furious with me. And sure. I said, listen, listen, this... You know, I, I, it doesn't mean that you need to leave the church, but we have some standards for people, you know, who are ministry and on the platform and um, uh, cohabitation is not acceptable. Well, eventually they 
six months or so later, they got married, asked me to do the wedding. I did counseling with them and then uh, worked with them and, and uh, got him back on the platform. And, and we were very, very open about it. So, um, you know, just being able to have those kinds of conversations to be able to work through things, I believe, is the godly way to approach it. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, those, those power play moments that you were talking about. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely, there are those agendas that are out there. Uh, but but I, I'm not surprised by your answer as far as loving to build into people's lives and encourage people's lives because i've seen that in you and the interactions that we've had something that i can see as a huge strength uh that you have so you do that a lot um you've done it through pastoring you've done it through instructing you also do like some some coaching and mentoring as well i know so um is it just I, i'm just wondering what you like about that the most is it just kind of something that God, it's just the way God has gifted you to be able to just pour into and build up people? You know, I, I, I learned something from a lay person about 15 years ago. Um, uh, probably one of the most vital things I've ever learned. Uh, this person had the heart of a servant and serving doesn't come naturally to me. It has to be by design. And I would hear him say to people, let me know if there's any way I can serve you. And I went, wow, I wonder if I could say that to somebody now. And, and so I began to practice it as a spiritual discipline. Okay. How can I serve you? And Jay, maybe you've even heard me say that to you yes. um, or, or others that in groups that we've, we've been in. Sure. Now, I'm not going to come and clean your toilet or wash your car or something like that. But is there some way that I can walk with you to build into you? You know, my life vision statement that I believe God has called me to is to make a difference, to make an impact in the lives of people. That's it. You know, and that's not something that you ever fully attain. It's always out there. And somebody says, well, how do you do that on a daily basis? I said, I don't know. It just depends on whoever I encounter. And if I have that in mind, how can I serve you? Then I am aware and attentive to possibilities. It may be with the person at the checkout counter at the grocery store. How can I build into their life in some way to make it easier. Yeah, they're probably my age, possibly older. Why are they here at the checkout counter? Well, maybe their pension and social security isn't sufficient. And so at their age, they're standing here eight hours doing this. How can I help them, mm -hmm. you know, in some way today? So what I like most about uh, coaching and mentoring and walking alongside people, it goes back to those tender moments of grace and mercy, you know, when I can help a person have a deeper level of their own self-awareness, who they are, their uniqueness, their design, and their willingness to embrace that and to begin to see what is right about them. Uh, because oftentimes so many people are burdened by what's wrong about themselves. But if they begin to look at what's right about themselves, it helps them uncover a new sense of freedom. And I know that the freedom that they're sensing is because of God. Uh, and, you know, I work a lot in the secular uh, section and so, uh, and sector. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't be overt about my, uh, my faith, but I, I'm always thinking about it. It is always a foundation. And I know that the freedom that these people are beginning to experience is because of God and the great gift that they have been given to themselves that no one else in the world has received. And that is who they are. They've been given the gift of themselves. And I encourage them to go deeper throughout life experience, to find that sense of meaning and purpose and freedom, to discover what their wheelhouse is, their sweet spot, and to do so in life, you know, gently but firmly. And sometimes I'm able to share with them a quote from Teresa of Avila, uh, that humility is walking in the truth of who they are. So don't be embarrassed by who you are, but walk in that truth. Amen. Now, one thing that you were just mentioning, which might stand out to some people, and 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 it uh, kind of stands out to me, is people will think, well, okay, wait a minute, you've been a pastor, you're instructor, you're professor in a in a Christian seminary. What do you mean you're working in the secular realm? <laughs> you, know, you know, a lot of people will say, 
hey, I, I just you stay in your lane. Yeah. And, and yeah. It, it's safe there. I mean, that there's plenty of people there. That's what you do best. But those encounters, I mean, we look at the ministry of Jesus, for example, who's going everywhere and and kind of a your your approach that you're mentioning here is kind of similar to what we see with Jesus. Okay. Who is it that you're going to encounter? Um, those encounters are not by chance, they're divine appointments. And how are you going to have some type of blessing or something into into their life? So do you kind of go by the, the three-foot rule where, hey, everyone that I come in encounter with, with for some reason, I'm going to try to impart something into them? And doesn't it, going in the secular realm, give you way more opportunity than if you just stayed within safe walls? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I used to tell people in my local church when I was preaching, you know, there were people there on Sunday morning who'd been walking with Jesus for 50 years, and I had folks in there that didn't know God from a goose. And um, and and they would say, you know, can you give us some more meat? Why why are you preaching to those who don't know God? And I said, listen, you all you folks, you're Olympic swimmers, okay? And if you're in the pool and somebody who doesn't know uh, how to swim is going down for the third time. I'm going after them because you can make it to the side. I can help you later, but they're going to drown if I don't reach out. And so I feel like I'm doing greater, more significant ministry in the marketplace than I ever did in the local church. Uh, because I was within the safe walls there and was so uh, focused upon, you know, building the church, programming the church. Not to say that that wasn't viable ministry. That's what I was called to do, and I did it with every fiber of my being. Uh, but now I'm outside of the local church, and uh, I feel more freedom than I've ever had uh, and have more resources, I feel, and more um, want to uh, than I've had. I'm having more fun now than I've ever had in my life. Yes, yes. Now, tying that in, because you, you mentioned some of the twists and turns in your life earlier, mm -hmm. even some of the disappointments that you had to work through, challenges you had to work through. Mm -hmm. um, as God works that all together for good, do you feel that He's also taken it, and, and I know he does this with people all the time. Um, he's taken it, and even what some would consider maybe a little baggage, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. allowed that to be a part of what gives you the understanding and maybe even the, the positional place to be able mm -hmm. to pour into mm -hmm. some people who are going through some of the same things. Sure. Sure. I like to look at all of my experiences in life, not as baggage, but as opportunities, possibly challenges. Uh, they do not define my future. They have helped shape and form who I am at this point. But I can take all of that and Romans 8, 28, God's worked it all out for the good um, and be able to utilize it in some way and say, okay, God, this is, this is who you've created me to be. These are my life experiences. Nobody else in the world has had them. How can I utilize them to for the good of others to expand your kingdom? And so there's not very many things that surprise me when I encounter folks, you know, whatever the baggage is that they have going for them. Um, I work with a lot of secular organizations, a lot of secular teams, and what has happened is over time, and I don't tell them I'm a retired minister, but over time what has happened is I'll get, but they have my cell phone number and my, <laughs> I'm kind of going against, you know, what I was when I was in the local church, but my sure. cell phone number and the, my email address, if I've communicated with them email, they have access to me. And I have gotten dozens of calls from people and saying, Bill, I didn't know who else to call. Mm -hmm. You know, my girlfriend left me, my kid is in, on drugs, you know, what do I do? And I have an opportunity to walk them through this and go, are you a faith-based person? Well, no, not really. Well, I'm going to start praying for you. And I've never had anybody refuse a prayer, anybody, anywhere, uh, in any situation. Now, it's not something that I'll thump people over the head with or say I'm coming in to work with a with a team in a you know $60 million a year organization and go, okay, this is going to be like a Bible study. Get ready. No, I have to meet them where they are and earn their trust. I can't assume authority. 
I can't assume that just because I got a bunch of letters behind the name, my name, that they're going to listen to me. I have to earn their trust and meet them where they are. And, and you know what? Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and trust, trust, according to Gallup research, trust is the number one thing that employees need from their team leaders. They need to be able to trust them. And so yes. trust is a huge piece and open and honest communication, you know, comes in that. And so those are the things I seek to engender and teach and guide and help folks learn. And in the middle of that, then they become, they create a psychological safety where they can be appropriately vulnerable and transparent, you know, and go, yeah, this is what's going on in my life. So that comes from even even them approaching you, as you mentioned, and that comes just from uh, genuine interaction and the mm-hmm. sense that they have that this person just doesn't have an agenda, but this person actually has some care and concern for me as a person and shows mm-hmm. it on a regular basis. So those relationships are built. And, yeah, and if like, I if I if I don't say how can I serve you, they see it or hear it or feel it in some way through my interaction with them. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. So um, as you're interacting with people, here's a good question. Is there, are there certain areas that seem to come up more, certain challenges that you really see standing out today that people are going through um, that are just, uh, they're having a hard time with? What, What are the without giving specific people, obviously, sure. what are the types of things that people seem to be going through the most? You know, in, in, in my, in my studies, I've read a lot of the early church fathers and, you know, 2000 years ago, 1900 years ago, St. Augustine wrote uh, that pride is the number one uh, failing of humankind. And when our pride gets in the way, uh, we are blinded, we become myopic, we can't see anything else. Mm-hmm. And probably that's what I run into the most uh, is pride and the pride that comes out of fear and insecurity, not knowing oneself. So I encounter folks who are unwilling to have a second thought or be willing to be wrong or they're unteachable. And those folks are sometimes the most difficult to reach Um, but if I can get to a place where they begin to trust me and know that I am there to serve them and to help them, as long as they will interact with me, they know that I'm not going to give up. And slowly, and I've seen it, sometimes it takes two or three years. Um, uh, here's, here's a case in point. When I retired from, from ministry, I uh, decided to get into a golf league and, Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'd never been in one because it was difficult to, when I was a local, uh, local pastor, to be able to commit to a day a week during the summer. And so the first thing I did is joined the golf league. And I was teamed up with a guy. He's a, um, uh, didn't know him. His name is Jim. And he um, uh, is a Vietnam vet. Okay. And I remember starting off on, the, and I did tell him I was a pastor, a retired minister. I went, no, they're just going to go out here and see how I fit in and see what unfolds. And uh, that first tee box, when he hit a shot that he didn't like, man, the air turned blue. And I thought, oh, boy, I'm in for a ride. And so I've played golf with Jim. This is the 10th season every summer. And two weeks ago, I told him that I was a retired minister. But all during this time. He never saw me throw a club. He never heard me swear. He never heard me say a disparaging word about anybody. He's had a couple of surgeries, and he'd send me a text. He'd say, hey, you know, I don't know what it is about you, Bill, but could you pray for me? And so, Mm -hmm. you know, it's been a 10-year process. Now, I haven't laid out the gospel to Jim. I'm not certain what his faith is, but the door is open, and it took 10 years to get there. Now, you're mentioning that, and and I think a lot of us have a problem with that today in this microwave, let's do everything fast. Uh, I I, I order at the drive-thru, and what do you mean I have to wait two minutes when I get to the window type of mentality that sometimes things take time. 
you know, are, are you willing, are people willing to be a person's friend no matter what? Um, are people willing to be there for somebody, even if they're not, you know, just falling down on their knees and turning to God and all that? Um, does the person have value regardless? Mm. And they're not just a notch on a belt. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I love what you're, what you're saying there because most unfortunately will not wait. It's like, ah, yeah. I've talked to them for a year or two. They, they just keep doing the same things. Uh, you know, mm. they're just not going to change. Um, have you heard of, I mean, I know stories, I'm sure you do as well, where like spouses or different ones have, have prayed for somebody for like 30 years. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, so God knows, but we, we don't have a control on the timing. No, God never gives up and you know, it's God's perfect timing. And I'm not certain what that is. All I need to do, my responsibility is to lean into the whispers of the Holy spirit and seek his guidance not mine. I can get anxious. I can get uh, upset and frustrated. Come on, Jim, you know, quit, uh, quit coat in the air with all that blue language. You don't need that. It's not necessary. I go, okay. You know, I've heard it before. Um, but this is about Jim right? and his, the exposure of what he says and his behavior, he's a recovering alcoholic. He's a recovering drug addict. Um, you know, so he has some wherewithal within him to uh, be open to full redemption. Amen. Amen. All right. I love it. I love it. Well, as we move on here, you have a focus on and a heart for urban ministry. Mm -hmm. In fact, you have developed a program for urban ministry for pastors who mm -hmm. are in that. And kind of maybe kind of give us a little bit of a touch of, on why, how God put that on your heart and what you're trying to uh, achieve um, as he's led you in that direction. Yeah. You know, um, I grew up in white privilege. Now that doesn't mean my family had a lot. Uh, my dad was a tenant farmer, so we didn't have much, but white privilege means that I never had to worry about what store I walked into or what block I walked around because of the color of my skin. And so all the churches where I've pastored have not been very diverse. Some of them, you know, rural churches or county seat towns. The last one where I was pastors in, you know, Lansing, Michigan, it was a fairly significant church. And so it was, had some diversity, but not very much. And um, it wasn't until I left the pastor and began to teach over in Detroit uh, for the seminary, the programs that they had over there, about 90% of my classroom was African-American. And I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting to navigate this. But I just wanted to be myself. And I remember the first course I taught was church history. Mm -hmm. So church history is really brought in two two sections, you know, Christ through Reformation, Reformation through present day. So, you know, was in the second half of it, Reformation through present day, working through it chronologically, Western Christianity and uh, the Civil War and the church's part in the Civil War. And I looked out over my classroom of 25 people, two of whom were white, and I was the white professor you know, the sage on the stage, so to speak. And I began to think about what their experience had been. And I just began to weep mm -hmm. because I said to them, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for why the civil war even happened to get rid of slavery and that what your uh, race has experienced and what uh, has been done to you over these 200 years. And I just broke down and cried. And they were the most gracious people I have ever encountered in my life. Mm -hmm. Extending grace to me. Dr. Beachy, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you for your apology. You didn't do it, but we appreciate you acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the Holy Spirit swept through that classroom in the most powerful way I've ever experienced a setting outside of the local church and there was redemption and there was healing and there was understanding 
and I began to I began to have compassion for them. Compassion comes from a Latin root word compati, which means to suffer with. Mm-hmm. And I was suffering with them. And it just began to grow. I was working with a group of pastors um, that I'll talk about later in a in a cohort, and and in January when um, uh, MLK's birthday came up, one of them said, "Can we do something tonight in memory or in recognition of the work of MLK?" And I said, "Yes." And so we we had to go to another room for uh, technical reasons to be able to show a video clip, and it was a video clip of. Um, MLK's sermon, you know, um, I believe knocking on the door at midnight or the midnight hour, I can't remember the precise name of it. And the middle of that, you know, I began to weep again. So we're in this dark room watching this video clip and these seven African-American pastors come around me while I'm weeping and lay their hands on me and begin to pray for me. And then one of them said, well, good, we've prayed for Dr. Beachy. Now, let the white man weep. Let him weep. It's good for him to experience this. And he was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So I began to look at the ministry that the African-American population had in the Detroit area and their lack of of access to theological education, Uh, oppressed, ostracized, under-resourced, excluded, you know, not having the kinds of opportunities that I have because of white privilege. And God was saying, you need to do something here. And so I created a a certificate program at that time called a Certificate in Christian Ministries, which wasn't accredited. But it was five catalog courses that were kind of cut back a little bit from the seminary catalog courses and began to uh, utilize that to teach pastors co co uh, or bivocational pastors, pastors who didn't have an undergraduate education, who didn't have any access to education, but they were doing marvelous ministry work. And in a couple of years, I was able to, um, oh, I think I we had about 80 people go through that. And uh, the program was shut down because it wasn't financially viable, which is, happens quite often. I was exceptionally disappointed with that. Eventually, the Detroit campus was closed down. Again, this was during COVID. Um, it was an economic uh, decision, but I wasn't about to give up. And so we, we got another grant from Lilly, another million-dollar grant. And the dean asks asked if we had any ideas for the proposal. And they had three different uh, approaches that there are two different that they were going to do. One was a new degree at the seminary. One was based on a curriculum review at the seminary. And then I designed um, a graduate certificate called Faith-Based Entrepreneurship. And so they integrated that into the Lilly Grant, and we received the million-dollar grant. So that was two years ago. And finally, this fall, uh, we're going to kick off in a couple of weeks, uh, the first um, – the first course I'm teaching, leadership course and spiritual formation course. We're partnering with the uh, MBA department at the university, and so there'll be an entrepreneurship course, financial management, and then a theology course. And what my hope is, is that, and I, I did, had these African American pastors in mind. Now, this first year, we're not able to accept anybody on a bachelor exempt probationary status. They have to have an undergraduate degree, but we're working through with uh, accreditation folks that next year we'll be able to do that. So a lot of those pastors in Detroit who don't have undergraduate degrees Mm -hmm. can take this program. So they have 16 graduate credits. Normally it would cost $12,000 and we're offering it for $3,900, $300 a month. And so, uh, that they can have something, a certificate that gives them a credential to do the work that they're doing. At the same time, help them understand how to build a business plan, develop a budget, do financial management, have a theology course that's going to under good thinking. The leadership course, uh, I will uh, guide them through developing their own personal vision, mission, and core value statements, and develop Mm -hmm. strategies, tactics, and implementation plan for what it is that God is calling them to do that'll be a capstone at the end of the program. There, that was a 
drink of water from a fire hydrant, wasn't it? <laughs> well, you know what strikes me in what you're saying, and, and I love the program that you, you've come up with. I've encountered this through the years as well, where I, I've noticed something that's alarming, and that's that, like ministries that I've worked with, and you see where they're located. And then there'll be areas like I'm, I'm in Southern California. So mm -hmm. there'll be areas like in what's greater LA where it's more of the, the lower economic and there's a big hole. There was, there was like, they would have no ministries there. It was all around. And, and even when there's been discussions, churches, church planting, um, if you're going to relocate your church, where are you relocating to? And it always comes back to the human thinking, which you've already mentioned. Well, where will it be financially viable? Where is it? Who are we targeting? Are they going to be able to support the church uh, financially? And, and so obviously, certain areas are ignored just for, even if it's not for the color of the skin, just for the economic uh, part. And when I look at the Bible and I look at what Jesus told us, that doesn't line up. And and so have you have you noticed that then as you've been developing this? I'm sure that it seems that the American church, I mean, I'm using generalities here, but, but it has maybe had a problem for getting the mandate of Jesus to minister to everyone and to the poor and to the sick and to the oppressed and, and all of that, there, there seems to be a, an abandonment to that. Have you noticed yeah. that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's the bottom line, you know, it's even in churches, it's political and economic. If you get right down to it, in many cases, that's a very broad generalization and some will push back against that. And I'm, and I'm open to that. I understand that uh, in this program that I've developed, you know, I fought for it for two years. It took a million dollar grant from the Lilly foundation to be able to get it going. Yeah. And, and this 60% reduction in the tuition cost of it. So I'm going to have, I think, five or six, seven students in his first cohort, you know, and really scrambled, didn't get, anyway, I, I won't get into that, but he, I really scrambled just to get that, get those five or six, seven students. And my hope is, is that once we kick this, once we kick this off, that some of my work in the secular world, because currently I have a um, um, contract with one of the top 10 um, philanthropic organizations in the country. Okay, I'm doing leadership development with them. So my end goal, my end goal is maybe one or two years down the road is they pass out grants to all sorts of nonprofits, primarily to those that are under-resourced, uh, underprivileged, et cetera, et cetera, that I can get them to point some of their money towards this program to underwrite the cost for the folks that are needing to come to it but don't have access to it because of the financial reasons. Yeah, and, and there you're making a point. Again, I don't I don't mean to be critical. I'm just making an observation that I mean it, it's what God will use from any source. Mm. And, and often, isn't it crazy though that often there seems to be more hope to get it from the secular world where it should be, you know. I mean, I'm just venting here, but yeah, yeah, no, no, I I hear you. And it's you know, I just, I look at that and if I hit a dead end, I go, okay, well, I'm going to persevere. I'll just find a way to circumvent that dead end and keep on going. I'm not right. going to, I'm not going to quit. I'll just look for it wherever, wherever I can. Any of the yeah. contacts I have continually nurturing that because um, I believe in this program. And so a lot of the work that I do in the secular world, while I don't, I'm not overt with that. Uh, with folks is I'm building relationships, you know, with this philanthropic organization, they have 110 employees, $4.5 billion in assets. Mm -hmm. If I can get into the whole, whole organization and do work with all 110 employees and develop a model for leadership development that can be utilized by philanthropic organizations around the world, then I've even got a bigger uh, palette to choose from and point them in the direction of doing some good for others. Great stuff. Great stuff. Well, just a couple more questions. This has been okay. great, by the way. I hope yeah. people are, are definitely blessed by it. Um, 
Asbury University is something mm-hmm. you were connected with to a degree. I know it was the seminary, yes, but you're yeah. you're you're familiar with it. It was kind of in the news um, a few months ago. Lots of things going on there. Uh, revival. Uh, it was going on for weeks, I believe. Um, anything you want to add to it? I mean, observations. Maybe you know yeah, a little more. Yeah. A lot of people aren't that familiar with it. Well, I went to I went to seminary in Wilmore at Asbury Seminary for three years, and then went back and was on the faculty for three and a half years. The seminary and the college are on opposite sides of the streets, and the running dialogue in town at that point was that the university was the law side and the seminary was the grace side. Uh, in Wilmore, Kentucky, and it was originally founded, Asbury Seminary, founded uh, 50, 100 years ago in Wilmore because it was 50 miles from the nearest sin. I mean, that's that's in their, in their charter or something, uh, oh, wow. uh, because Wilmore is not on the way to anywhere. And it was born out of that entire sanctification holiness movement around yeah. the turn of the 19th century. Okay. If you drive through Mil- Wilmore and continue on the road through town, you come to a dead end at the Kentucky River, about four miles. So I have read about, uh, I haven't been down there since this revival started. I know there was a revival about 50 years ago, 1971, mm-hmm. that kind of swept the country. And I've read about different, read things about different organizations that have sought to scale this revival or to replicate it or to institutionalize it or to take it to other campuses. You know, but my hope is the Spirit of God is going to continue to be poured out just for the sake of it, the Mm -hmm. sake of the Spirit of God, that this isn't something, that this doesn't become transactional, that this doesn't become something that is institutionalized or scalable, or somebody looks at it as a marketing opportunity to bring about a greater level of the bottom line uh, for them. And, you know, those sorts of things, you know, throughout my, throughout my career, my ministry, I mean, the very first church I pastored, we closed its doors under my leadership. That was in Plainview, Texas, little United Methodist Church, about 45 people. I preached there for a year. At the end of the year, I was going to go to another town to go to school. And so my district superintendent said, I don't know what I'm going to do with this place because, you know, when I got you, I scraped the bottom of the barrel. What are we going to do with it? Well, the church was in the southwest side of town, and the parsonage was in the northeast side of town, and people drove past two other Methodist churches to come to this little white church, white uh, church there on the southeast side. And it was surrounded by migrant workers, Hispanic, Latino migrant workers from Mexico. I didn't know any better. I was 22 years old. I just went around and started knocking on doors saying, hey, we got this church. You know, most of the time my Spanish wasn't very good. Most of the time it was the kids that interpreted for mom and dad. And lo and behold, some of them started coming to church. And they couldn't understand much of what I would say, but they wanted the fellowship. And much to the chagrin of the white population of that church. So at the end of the year, when I was getting ready to leave, my district superintendent said, what are we going to do with this? I said, listen, why don't we just give the church to the Hispanic-speaking denomination of the United Methodist Arm and turn it over to them? What a great ministry they would have right here. And uh, he rolled his eyes, you know, here's this 22-year-old kid that's a neophyte, green behind the ears. And he said, okay. So he presented it to the congregation, had a vote, and the nays out yelled the yays, said, no, we're not giving our church away. Mm -hmm. And I whispered to the district superintendent, I said, let's take a ballot vote. So we ripped a piece of paper, took a ballot vote. We counted them up, and the yeses outvoted the noes. Okay. So we gave the church to the Rio Grande Conference of the United Methodist Church. My last three weeks there was very difficult. I began to, things began to disappear. There was uh, uh, the desk in my office disappeared, a pew disappeared, the piano disappeared, all the stuff in the kitchen disappeared, things off the walls and everything because they didn't want to give it away. Uh-huh. So we closed it up. I never went back until about 10 years ago. Now, mind you, this was in 1974. So in the, um, about 10 years ago, my 12 years ago, my wife and I drove down to Texas and I said, I want to drive through Plainview and drive past that church. And we pulled up in the parking lot and I just began to weep because it was beautifully painted flowers growing lawn manicured. And there was a sign said, um, San Juan Unidos Methodito. Methodisto, 
it was still going strong. I said, yes, God, you were right. You were right. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been a disruptor, always been somebody who said, that's not right. Or, you know, expanded the envelope. And I've made a lot of people uncomfortable over the years, but I'm just unwilling to let injustice, social injustice, peace and social justice issues go unaddressed. That's great. I don't know what I don't know whether I answered your question, but I certainly did chase a rabbit there. It, it was very a lot of value right there. We're going to let you finish up with okay. a very open question. Okay, All right. and you you mentioned the spirit of God, so I'm going to let the spirit of God lead your answer. Um, this is going to be watched. Who knows when at various times by people out there that God's just going to lead to it for some reason or another. And here we are at the end of the interview, so this would require somebody to actually watch it all the way through. But there's going to be people at various times that are going to hear the answer to this question. And they may be struggling. They may be searching for something that they just can't find in life. Uh, There's no peace there. Um, There's a void. And I believe that God would lead you to kind of share what it is that they need or might help them. I'm going to let you share whatever message that is right now. Okay. Friends, I believe that you, along with everybody else in the world, every human being was created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, the first part of the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth and so on and so forth. And um, if you've read that, you notice at the end of each day of creation, God said, this is good. But then in Genesis 126, it's as if everything shifted. It's as if God turned to the community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and said, let us create humankind in our own image and likeness. And so God created you unique, unlike anybody else in the whole world, fingerprints, retina scans. But more important than that was what's right about you, the design and uh, that you have. And so if you don't know Jesus, there is an image of God within you, and there is a longing in your heart. I think there's three universal longings that every person has, and that is for acceptance, significance, and security. Those three passions of the soul. And we look for that, and we long for that, and the things that we own, or the status that we attain, or the ability to be acknowledged by others. We look for it in so many ways. And all of those are dead ends. I've tried it. I've done it. And there are still times when I move outside of that leading of God, and I look for acceptance or significance or stability in some other ways. But God continually brings me back to that place where Paul talks about the peace that passes all understanding. And that's walking with my rabbi day by day so closely that the dust from his footfall can fall upon my shoulders, saying yes to Jesus, accepting Jesus. Now, things won't necessarily go right or go just the way that you want them to. They certainly have it in my life. But I do know this and can say this without reservation. My Redeemer has been faithful and true every step of the way in the brokenness, broken marriages, kids on drugs, uh, losing positions, being ostracized by people, being on the outside, so many different things, sleepless nights. God has been faithful and true. And all God is asking you to do is to take a moment and to be still and to say, is there God? And God, if you're there, would you give me Jesus? Give me Jesus in the morning. Give me Jesus in the afternoon. Give me Jesus all day long. And you may or may not feel something. There may or may not be dramatic changes to your life. But keep walking in faith. And I would say to you, friends, if your faith is weak, at some point, please reach out to me. I'm going to ask Jay to give my contact information. Please reach out to me, and I'm very willing to serve you. So may I serve you in some way that the peace that passes all understanding might be revealed to you. God bless. Amen. Great message. So as you mentioned, what what is the best way? I'm not going to necessarily ask for you to put your cell phone out there. But what is the best way for someone to contact uh, who would like to do that? Um, R- Bill 
at beachygroup.com. Bill at Bill. Beachy Group. Um, yes, there's a, there's now. there's a website coming. It's just a, a coaching uh, organization that I've created and actually just have rebranded to Beachy Group. BeachyGroup dot com. So nice. write to me, Bill at BeachyGroup dot com, and oh, in the next uh, six weeks, where there'll be a website up for more information. Well, I can tell you from knowing Bill. And knowing that his character that he has portrayed and shown here today is consistent with who he is. That's who he's been every time that I've encountered him. So if you reach out to him, if he has blessed you in some way, or you just feel there's just something about him that um, that he would have some help for you, I know that uh, he's more than willing uh, to respond to you, and he will. So I encourage you to go ahead and reach out. Bill, also, we're, we're going to be definitely in prayer about uh, the program coming up and everything that you're doing. Thanks. And we just appreciate your time so much today. I'm sure that many have been blessed by it and will be blessed by it. So for those of you who have watched the podcast today, be sure to uh, share it with others that you think will be encouraged as well. This has been the Audacious Faith Podcast. Uh, we love you. We'll see you next time. God bless. God bless. God bless.